Good morning, everyone. Last lecture before the panel and our little break. I'm going to be talking to you about a topic that, uh, as a clinician, as a researcher, I care a lot about and have tried to improve the management of. It's a highly evidence-based talk, um, partly because there are so many studies covering this area. Um, I'm going to try and justify why we do what we do at Stanford. And um, in no way am I implying you need to blindly follow the prescription that I'm giving you, more just to make sense of it and the literature out there and then to adapt it to your own clinical practice. Um, this is my conflict of interest. No of these products that we'll actually discuss, but I just wanted to give you a complete um, disclosure of uh, what conflict of interest may exist. The other disclosure is I'm going to be focusing primarily on acute pain. Uh, this is a graph from a really good review by Lavoie and colleagues. If you look at the far left, that's uh, pain, acute pain at time zero, you'll see the vast majority of women have uh, pain, which is described as moderate to severe after a cesarean delivery, and in the range of the equivalent of the pain you would experience after a hysterectomy. Um, so this is the area I'm going to be focusing on. But appreciate the fact that pain doesn't stop then, and there's a continuum. And different authors have looked at pain beyond the acute phase. And you can see the incidence probably is around 10%. And there is a very strong association between acute pain and ongoing chronic pain. So at least it's a noble uh, target to try and improve the acute pain. It doesn't necessarily mean you will decrease chronic pain, but I am focusing primarily on acute pain. The other thing to appreciate is there is an association between pain and opioid use, and the big concern about ongoing opioid use after that acute period, after your um, surgical period, and it's becoming something that's been more recently highlighted in the literature and then obviously functional recovery linked to that. Um, this is a study, it's now a little dated, where we ask patients at the um, uh, pre-op class what they most wanted to avoid. Uh, we gave them potential outcomes that they could rank as well as throw a relative $100 towards most wanting to avoid. And you can see pain during and after cesarean delivery being the most important. Um, and it's an important graph to appreciate because um, it puts in perspective the fact that people rank certain things more importantly, but that a lot of the opioid-related side effects are of more, more minor concern to patients. Now, remember, this is a population-derived one, and amongst individuals, you may have variation within that, and it does beg the question about in, uh, engaging patients in their decision-making, which will be the talk of next year's topic um, after we've published our work. So I'm going to go through various options that we can offer women for cesarean delivery. And I appreciate, as anesthesiologists, we have a lot of decisions to make every morning. Um, and I'm going to try and make this decision slightly easier for most of you. Um, this was highlighted in the first session by Lawrence about the dramatic decline of general anesthesia uh, that took place in the 80s in the US. And essentially, it's diminished to an expectation of at least less than 1% of elective cases. And if you ask the Society of Obstetric Anesthesia members what they most would like to, um, most, the technique they most like to apply in the elective setting, the vast majority, 85 plus percent, will say they want to do a single shot spinal and a handful um, doing a CSC or epidural technique. So I'm going to focus on that. And one of the good things about the neuroaxial space, now that we no longer do general anesthesia, is we have the ability to give a drug, an opioid, in the area that is most likely to be effective. And this has been shown in many studies, we sort of gave up on it because in the, the 80s, this was so well demonstrated and meta-analysis to show that the most effective way of giving an opioid is in the neuroaxial space. Ideally, intrathecally, because it's the smallest dose and the least exposure to a, a fetus has to have um, prior to the cesarean delivery, so you want to use the smallest doses. But neuroaxial administration is by far the best route, but only for the first 24 hours, and we can discuss a little bit about that. So there was a meta-analysis by Dahl. It's a little dated now, but the message is similar, and I'll show you some of the work we've done. But the median time for analgesic effect as you use a surrogate marker, which is time to first um, a request for opioid, is 27 hours. But as you see from the graph on the right, there is a step-off 
Now, why I show you that graph is in A and B, that is bupivacaine, plain bupivacaine, and B is bupivacaine plus fentanyl. And you can see fentanyl does not give you meaningful post-operative pain relief. It is purely a drug that is ut utility is limited to the intraoperative period. Um, and you can see the, the, the survival curves following very similar trajectories. Whereas C and D is when you add the intrathecal morphine, and you can see how long the prolonged um, uh, effect is. So median 27 hours, but there's a huge uh, range amongst patients, and you can see with a step off in some patients almost immediately they need analgesics, and other patients go all the way through never requiring any further analgesia. So I mentioned a short-acting lipophilic opioid like fentanyl or sufentanyl. It has an absolute role in the intraoperative setting, partly because morphine takes up to 90 minutes to work, so it's not going to give you meaningful intraoperative relief. And what a, a lipophilic opioid can do is allow you to use less local anesthetic, and by that you'll use get less hypotension. There's good evidence from meta-analysis you can significantly drop intraoperative discomfort, uh, decrease, believe it or not, you decrease nausea even though you're giving an opioid, probably because of less um, visceral afferent um, sensation from pulling on the um, uh, uterus. Uh, you can decrease shivering as well as pruritus. There has been a concern about if you add the combination that it can block the receptors for morphine to work and you could get a, an acute tolerance-like picture, but we showed very subtle effects, not justifying not using um, the drug. So this is in press. We recently conducted a meta-analysis with the idea of trying to define what is the best dose. And if nothing else, similar to what Lawrence has just been telling you, to try drive physicians to using smaller doses. Um, there's been a, a tendency from when the first prescription of uh, morphine was actually 10 milligrams intrathecally before we realized actually less is more and it's gone down and down and down over the, the course. Now we chose 100 as the cutoff for low and high. You can say it's somewhat arbitrary, but a lot of studies that have looked at low and high have chosen that. And it was an uh, effort to try and drive uh, a lower dose. So if you look at all the studies that have been published on it, so we have 11 studies and 400 odd patients. Um, you can see that the only real analgesic benefit we could find was our primary outcome measure, was duration of analgesia, which is four and a half hours. That's the only difference you're going to get between a dose of somewhere between 50 and 100 and larger doses somewhere between um, uh, uh, greater than 100 to 250. So that is all we could find. No difference in opioid consumption or pain in the first 24 hours. But you do drive a lot of extra side effects with pruritus and nausea and vomiting. So this is that balance between analgesic efficacy and clearly there is a ceiling effect. And when you go above 100, you likely are above that ceiling effect and there's no real justification. But I'm going to say I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because the truth is at Stanford we use 150. <laughs> so our incredibly evidence-based approach towards this has been us arguing over two decades between 100 and 200 milligrams. And <laughs> we eventually decided to just split the difference. But clearly there is a analgesic ceiling. And you really need to look at your institution and your patient population, their demands. But less is more, and definitely the flat part of the curve is already apparent at 100 milligrams, and you're going to get very little extra gain going beyond that, and you absolutely are going to introduce side effects, particularly pruritus and then nausea and vomiting. If you are going to administer an, o an opioid epidurally, let's say you do a CSE technique, my advice would be give it intrathecally. But if it's a, a top up after a labor um, epidural that then goes to C section, then it is worth utilizing morphine at the end of that. And the equivalent ratio is about 1 to 20. So if you use 150 micrograms intrathecally, you would use 3 milligrams epidurally for the same effect. And in two studies that have compared, Intrathecal and epidural administration show very similar uh, side effects and analgesic efficacy. So either route is fine. The preference is intrathecal because it's smaller doses and less fetal exposure. Now there's clearly a, a over-reliance on opioids, especially in the United States. We're going to go through all other analgesic modalities to try and reduce this over-reliance. And the next best drug after a, a neuroaxial opioid is non -steroidals. There are a host of studies showing its benefit. And if you look at the numbers needed to treat estimate, around two, this is in the same ballpark as opioids. So it is an extremely effective drug, particularly in this population. The opioid sparing effect has been estimated to be between 30 and 50% just using an NSAID. And if you pull enough patients from a meta-analysis, 
uh, you can actually decrease opioid related side effects. So not only using less opioids, but patients are getting less side effects. And what makes it really work very well in this setting is its ability to help with uh, uterine involution, visceral pain following cesarean delivery. We had a whole host of copsics that we could give. Um, eventually, there's only one left, coxic. I just want to highlight, if you are going to use this drug, that you really do need higher doses to get to the same numbers needed to treat that have been shown uh, with um, NSAIDs. Now, the evidence that it works in a perioperative setting has been limited to outside the cesarean section setting. Because in the two studies that have used it, have not found it to be as beneficial as an NSAID which is sort of interesting if that COX specificity limits its efficacy. So the current evidence would suggest an NSAID is a better drug to use in a, a, a perioperative a period in the cesarean section setting. In a perioperative uh, setting outside the cesarean section, maybe a, a, a coxic because of the less likelihood of um, platelet effect. It is a safe drug to use if you do have a patient who can't tolerate NSAIDs. The relative infant dose, and we're going to discuss this in a little while, is 0.3. Acetaminophen is not quite as analgesic, uh, the analgesic efficacy is not quite as good, but it's around 10 to 20 percent opioid sparing effect. And what has been recently shown in a meta analysis is it has an additive effect added to an NSAID. So just because you use an NSAID doesn't mean you shouldn't use acetaminophen, you should use them both concurrently. And with the IV preparation, it has allowed us to use this even when patients are NPO. Now, I'll show you how good this combination, the synergistic effect of an acetaminophen and oxycodone can be in a study that compared IV morphine, so patients had IV PCA, compared to taking as needed the oxycodone and acetaminophen combination worked not only better from an analgesic point of view, but were associated with less side effects. And it's for this reason that these combination drugs are largely popular throughout the United States. However, although the combination of drugs is, is useful, you shouldn't use the drug as a combination. And we used to use um, a, a equivalent of so Percocet or Vicodin as our um, drug of choice for breakthrough pain. And we would request it to try and keep our acetaminophen level less than three grams or around three grams and no more. And when you use it as a breakthrough drug, it is almost impossible to keep it under that threshold. So we uncoupled our acetaminophen. So instead of giving it as a combination drug, we gave around the clock acetaminophen. And then when there was breakthrough pain, oxycodone was offered to patients. And something as simple as that was able to reduce our opioid use by 50% in the first 24 hours and 30% in the next 24 hours. So although the combination works well, don't use the drug as a combination. Use that ability that you get a steady state concentration after three doses of acetaminophen. So every time you're then taking an, an opioid, you're getting that synergistic effect, but don't use the drug together. Tramadol is a drug that is an alternative for uh, breakthrough pain. It has been described following cesarean delivery. Um, interestingly, if you compare it to uh, a, a non-steroidal, it is less effective and it shows you that numbers needed to treat game. It's actually NSAIDs do really well and tramadol didn't work as well, but it worked better than acetaminophen. I don't think it's a better alternative than oxycodone and the numbers needed to treat would reflect that. But if you are going to use it in your institution as a breakthrough drug, it relative infant dose is 2% and it's certainly a drug that you can consider. So I've given you the basics be be behind three really good modalities. So a neuroaxial opioid, acetaminophen, and NSAIDs. If you combine all these three together, and then you look at our criteria by which we are meant to keep patients at pain scores three or less, only a third of patients are able to keep that with the current regime that I've proposed. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk about other alternatives that we can use to try and improve it. You could argue very easily that there is no point trying to drive pain lower than that because you may start introducing more side effects and there is a threshold beyond which I think you start having diminishing returns. But for what it's worth, there are a few other modalities. Now, transverse abdominis plane block is a block that was almost designed for our indication because of the fan and steel incision. Uh, um, the local anesthetic that effect that you get from a transverse abdominis plane block is going to give you excellent coverage around that area. So reliable blocks between 10, uh, T10 and L1. Um, so with that in mind, we were expecting really good analgesic effects from TAP blocks and a lot of studies. This is um, 
from two, a summary from two meta-analysis. There's actually been subsequent studies <coughs> since then, but the, the take-home message is the same, which is if you compare a, a tap block, if you add a tap block to a regime that doesn't have intrathecal morphine, so you use fentanyl, it does have an analgesic benefit. So that's the top forest plot um, subgroups. If you are use intrathecal morphine as part of your multimodal analgesia regime, it does not add additional analgesic benefit. This is a single shot block, tap, tap block done after cesarean delivery. And then if you compare tap blocks to intrathecal morphine, so as a comparator, comparison, uh, intrathecal morphine does better. And it makes sense in a way because intrathecal morphine is going to deal with both the somatic and visceral pain, um, and um, tap blocks are really limited to just the incisional pain. Um, but that's where we stand with how well tap blocks work following cesarean delivery. And there are concerns with tap blocks. In a really interesting study, pharmacokinetic study by Griffin, where they gave what I think is a reasonable dose for tap blocks, and they measured blood levels. 12 out of 30 exceeded a threshold beyond which you would have some concern, and three out of the 30 patients actually had some side effects associated with it. And there are now three reports of seizures in the literature, a uh, uh, case report uh, with two patients, and then a study that was actually interrupted because of a seizure. So it is not an inert procedure to be doing in patients, so we really need justifications for its use. So if you are not allowed to use intrathecal morphine or you prefer to not use it, it has an indication. In select patients, especially after a general anesthetic, if you're able to consent them before the general anesthetic, then it's worth doing. But I think the main indication for it is breakthrough pain. These are patients that are just not doing well in the PACU or when you go and see them on day one or two. And instead of accelerating the amount of opioids that you need to control pain, you can uh, use a tap block to get on top of the pain. But remember, the duration is limited to how long local anesthetic lasts. And there is only one case series of continuous tap blocks. And it's a difficult technique to actually work well, but it's something that you can consider using. Local anesthetic obviously can be given in the wound. The evidence that it actually works as a single shot technique after general anesthetic is there, but the way we do it under spinal, especially with our intrathecal opioids, it doesn't really make a difference. There is no study showing the long-acting local anesthetics make a difference. There is actually an interesting study that compared, is it better to give it pre-incision, post-incision, or a combination of pre and post, and found that pre and post combination is better than either. Uh, either way, but the local anesthetic is only going to last a certain amount of time, so the best way of administering it is as a continuous infusion, which is what we would uh, agree to, and there's a number of studies showing benefit both uh, opioid consumption but also pain, especially pain at movement. The r main reason why obstetricians and patients don't like this is you get a lot of leakage from the wound uh, when you use local anesthetics, especially when you're running the higher flow rates that are more effective. So there's an interesting study out of France that looked at where's the best place to put that catheter. And you would think it would be subcutaneously exactly where the wound is, and you'll numb up the area where the surgical incision is. But the evidence suggests it's better to do subfascially. And the reason probably is that you are numbing up the anterior cutaneous nerves that perforate through the rectus sheath, and you are more effectively able to um, provide anesthesia, and this is why um, in this particular study you quite show fairly a big effect size difference between the above fascia versus the below fascia placement. There is also some reason why this may work beyond just numbing nerves, is that you're getting spread of local anesthetic into the peritoneum, and that has been shown to be effective, the local anesthetic, and you're also going to get more systemic absorption. And we're all familiar with perioperative intravenous lidocaine infusions. This has been shown in many surgical models to be beneficial, probably because it has some interaction with the neutrophil priming, and therefore it's, it, it decreases pain accentuation at the, at the onset and allows quicker recovery. So there's functional recovery improvements, uh, better bowel function return. Saying that, it has never been studied following cesarean delivery. And in the two studies for hysterectomies, it did not seem to be beneficial. But this may all explain why local anesthetics work not just from a numbing nerve point of view, but more from a systemic effect point of view. Now, I know I've covered a lot of options. I'm just going to do two more, just because I think they're important drugs to appreciate in our setting. And the first one is gabapentin. So if you look at the evidence in the perioperative setting, there are many studies and two meta-analyses showing unequivocally that a 
a single dose in a perioperative setting prior to surgery works really well and provides meaningful pain relief. The problem we have in a cesarean section setting is there are three studies. The first one showed a difference, and the other three, all from the same group in Toronto, did not show significant benefit from gabapentin. And the limitation with that in the setting of cesarean delivery is that for the drug to work well, it's better as a preemptive agent. You cannot give it while the fetus is still in because you're having a very high transfer of drug and it is a neurotrophic drug. So you have to wait for after delivery. So that limits it. Breastfeeding should not be a limitation. The relative infant dose is very small. But there also are maternal side effects and sedations, especially if you're going to use ongoing doses as opposed to just limited. So, I think gabapentin is reasonable in select patients, but not for routine use. Dexamethasone is a drug that you think of more for nausea prevention, but actually it's a fairly reasonable analgesic. A recent meta-analysis involving a lot of patients showed a reasonable effect size um, of using dexamethasone as a single dose in a perioperative setting. And there are two studies that have looked at it from a cesarean section point of view and show not only decreasing pain, but also decreasing nausea. So it's a drug that you can consider in some patients. It's certainly a drug that you should think about when the obstetrician says, I don't want NSAIDs because there are concerns about bleeding. Um, so that's our protocol. It's all in your syllabus handout. It's what we've sort of devised from our own experience as well as combining the evidence base that I've gone through. Uh, we generally give patients 150 micrograms of intrathecal morphine. They get around the clock ibuprofen and acetaminophen and oxycodone for breakthrough pain. Um, usually about a third of patients don't even need oxycodone and the average oxycodone use is around two to three per patient. We try and reserve IV opioids, so rather get on patients pain with a tap block if they are, have significant pain after surgery or offer gabapentin to add to the analgesic efficacy because the whole idea is to try and reduce uh, as much the opioids as possible. In patients that we think are really going to be problematic, we would use an epidural technique. Uh, wound insulation in select patients, for example, my wife who goes for a cesarean delivery, and um, adjuncts like dexamethasone. I haven't covered ketamine or clonidine because the evidence really for its routine use is still not there. All right, so I'm going to end off in the last few minutes and talk about breastfeeding effects. <laughs> so that's inappropriate. <laughs> I have a habit of putting inappropriate stuff into the thing. All right, so <laughs> from a, a breastfeeding point of view, um, the vast majority of women and the US are now going to breastfeed. At Stanford, it's about 90%. It in keeps increasing because of all the benefits. Um, I want to just introduce you to two important concepts. The one is all analgesics are going to enter the breast milk. So yes, there is potential harm. But there is good evidence that if you provide good analgesia, um, you actually can improve breastfeeding. And there's a graph of um, weight gain, so indication of good breastfeeding in one group that got good epidural analgesia compared to another group that didn't have as good analgesia with um, IV opioid equivalents. So this is the only graph you need to remember from a breastfeeding point of view. Um, it's a little busy, but I'll try and go through exactly the important points to take home, which is the old concept with breastfeeding was that any drug you gave to a woman would go into the breast milk and stay there until the baby was going to feed, and then they would take up all the drug. We now know very clearly from a number of studies showing that it works very much on a passive diffusion model and it is based on maternal drug level. So when you really want to know how much of the drug is in the breast milk, then think at the time how much drug will be circulating in the, in the blood. And obviously simple pharmacokinetics of drugs can give you that estimation. You can think of how big a dose, what route, repeated doses, etc., and it gives you some estimation. Now just because the drug is in the breast milk, doesn't mean the breastfeeding neonate is going to be absorbing it because there is a thing called bioavailability. So if you have a drug that has low bioavailability and has to be given intravenously, is now in the breast milk, even though it's in the breast milk, baby's not going to um, take in any of it in or very little of it in. And the other concept is volume of breast milk consumed. And in the early peri peripartum period, the colostrum is tiny amounts, so really how much is going in is not a problem. This is usually becomes a bigger issue once the breast milk really kicks in and you start getting full volumes. And I've been talking a lot about this relative infant dose. It's really what 
dose the baby's getting relative to the mom's dose. It's something we can all understand. So when I was talking about in the range of 2%, you can see how low that is. We worry about the 10%. That's usually the threshold with the understanding that a newborn doesn't dr handle the drugs as well as the mom. So you want them to have at least less than 10%. And the only drug that comes anywhere near it is IV opioids, uh, large doses, and that can go in some studies showing around 10% relative infant dose. NSAIDs are by far the most breastfeeding friendly analgesics we have. Local anesthetics are similarly very breastfeeding friendly, and you can see the range of all the drugs that I've outlined there, really low and well below a threshold that we're concerned with. So just the last slide on opioids and breastfeeding. So that is the one that you really are going to try and minimize, and that can make the biggest difference to breastfeeding success because what it can cause is sedation. There is actually a case report of a fetal death, uh, a neonatal death, because of a woman receiving codeine. It has been criticized, even though it was published in The Lancet. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, they blame the drug being the fact that she was a rapid metabolizer of codeine and the baby wasn't. Um, but for what it's worth, try and use drugs that are recognized to be safe in breastfeeding um, setting. Uh, so fentanyl and morphine are compatible. Oxycodone and hydrocodone, as well as tramadol, are, are viewed as uh, reasonable drugs to use. The drugs to try and avoid, meperidine, because it's broken down to normoperidine and has a very long half-life. Buprenorphine has been associated with issues. And then codeine, as I mentioned. Um, so that's a whistle-stop tour through the approach that we use, the evidence base behind the various things, and emphasis on multimodal analgesia. Um, and I'm going to end there, and we get the panel discussion, and we can address any questions there. Thank you very much. <laughs>